this uh, Mary Kacha Chiradze. I tried my best here. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we know each other with Mary because we have like a common collaborator, so to say, Nikolai Mikli. But uh, yeah, so Mary did her uh, master's in Oxford. Uh, I think that was, I forgot what it was. It wasn't quantum information. That was some quantum field theory or something like that. It was categorical quantum mechanics. So, yeah, categorical so, theory. Oh, so yeah. a, a brand key kind of stuff. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah, okay. I was in his yeah, group. I, I, remember, I remember that much. And then <laughs> she went on to, to Siegen in the Western Germany and was doing ESD with Otfried Güner there. And uh, straight after this, she uh, she went for a postdoc to a let's say nearby uh, nearby city Cologne, and she's now with David Gross uh, as a postdoc there. And yeah, Mary specializes in uh, entanglement theory. Also has some interest in quantum computation, especially measurement-based quantum computing. And uh, yeah, especially I mean, and today she will be talking about. Uh, yeah, some, some new results she got in, in this realm. So it's a great pleasure to have you. Uh, and Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the screen is, is yours. So I let me first apologize. I Because of some urgent personal matters that popped out on my side, I probably will have to leave now. It's very, yeah. I OK. <laughs> I'm Thanks for introduction. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. introduction, Michal. Sorry. But OK, no worries. Record and uh, I. <laughs> Yeah. Don't worry. We can talk later. So, <laughs> ciao. <laughs> okay, so I guess I should start. Uh, I thank Michal for introduction and say bye, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so, actually, this is something mostly, part of mostly this work, as you see from the outline, like this is going to be based for several years of work during uh, my PhD. Uh, at the moment, I a bit changed, I mean, to my postdoc, I work more on foundations, but I am still interested in uh, this uh, topic of entanglement. And as you see, there is work in progress to finish up some of the things uh, in my PhD. When you change from your PhD, you are not so, I mean, new topics are exciting all the time, but this giving this talk motivated me to finish some of the things that I left out. So I wanted to thank Michal, but if he does, just show him this part. Thank you part <laughs> of the recorded video, if anything. Yeah, so. Uh, I'm going to be talking about hypergraph states in general. I made it uh, quite slow in the introduction because uh, I assumed there might be some masters or bachelor students. If I go too slow, please let's be informal and just kick me and I'll go faster. Uh, interrupt me anytime, ask me questions, and yeah, and I'll start. So I'm going to be focusing on, uh, oh, it doesn't, okay, now it's switch. Uh, on four different things, but uh, mostly they are going to be smoothly connected, I hope, to each other. So I'm going to start introducing measurement-based quantum computation. Then uh, this is going to be a big part of the talk because I want to mostly discuss what I think there is a problem there, which is still unsol unsolved. And if any of you are interested, I'm quite keen to think more about this problem, but I think it's quite difficult uh, to tell you in advance. Then I'll introduce graphs and hypergraph states and some of their entanglement theories to understand how MBQC works on hypergraph states in uh, particular, which I worked out in one of the publications. And then let's see if we want to discuss or uh, know something more about these states or in general, we have some questions. This, there's some time, hopefully. Okay, uh, so measurement-based quantum computation. So I assume most of you have heard what it is, but I'll start from the basics. So what happens there is that uh, uh, entangled state in the quantum uh, entire quantum computation is already pre-prepared. So there is a state here, which is correlated resource, and the entire computation happens while I'm making local measurements. And local measurements, as you see, let's assume the input is from here. There is some classical or quantum state. It's uh, up to you how you decide coming into this uh, uh, correlated resource state. You're somehow encoding. For example, think about teleportation protocol, and then you're making measurements sequentially okay then let's say the leftmost uh, is the first measurement and accordingly you are deciding which measurements to make in the future having already the outcomes of the previous ones 
And uh, you say that the state is a resource for measurement-based quantum computation or universal measurement-based quantum computation if it can implement some of the universal gates. So this is either this uh, uh, Toffoli uh, control control Z gate with a Hadamard or it's a Clifford circuit with a T gate, which is in the third Clifford hierarchy. If you don't know what exactly this means, please interrupt me, I'm happy to explain. If not, I quickly continue. This Clifford hierarchies, any questions? No? Okay, good. Good, we are all on, on the same page. So let's start from the, like, let's look at the resource just very uh, pictorially, what, it, what we have. So usually what people do is uh, they just uh, say that there is a input state, uh, there is no input state, they start from the computational basis and they prepare the input state and then act on it with some unitary. But it doesn't really matter. You can also think about that you are just teleporting this with a bell basis measurement input state to a resource, and then you have some output. If you want, you can talk about only classical post-processing that you measure your output in some basis. That's also possible. But your goal is to implement certain circuit, which uh, by unitary is described by you here. It's acts on the unitary input, and you want to produce some output, but there could be some randomness here. Okay, there could be because you are making some measurements, of course, you will have some random unitaries, but your goal is to tame this randomness in the sense that you don't want, you, they should somehow commute or they should somehow have some structure such that whenever you make measurements on the output over here, you know how to process, uh, process your classical data. You should know what are these errors here. If you don't know this, then you have not done really computation. I mean, you, you cannot interpret your results. So this is very important in measurement-based quantum computation. So let's consider the simplest example. We have Alice and Bob, they wanna implement the identity gate on arbitrary state psi in. So what it means is that they want to, the way we will do here is exactly the teleportation protocol. This is just to visualize what it exactly means, these random gates. So what happens, Alice makes the bell basis measurement. She gets one of the four outcomes. She encodes it into two classical uh, bits and then she sends them to Bob. And this is exactly what happens. If Bob receives zero and zero, he knows that he has, he doesn't have to apply any, uh, Bob doesn't have to do any correction. If he gets zero, one, he get, does X correction. If he does one, zero, then accordingly, right? So these are exactly these random gates. Good. So like with this, um, we come to the important concepts of measurement based quantum computation. So important concepts are many body entangled state. Uh, and uh, this is a, still a very big ongoing research. It was very hyped maybe five years ago, more, more or less, less people work on it now, but it's still an open question. Local measurements, which is just a resource for you, which local measurements to uh, make, this is more or less well understood. Taming randomness is very important to do computation, as we discussed already. And what, we, what I haven't discussed yet is the depth of computation. So uh, the measurement-based quantum computation depth is different from the usual, uh, uh, scheme of the circuit model. It doesn't depend which gates commute. It more, uh, the depth increases whenever you have to stop your computation, wait for the previous measurement outcomes, and then change the measurement basis. Okay, sometimes you have too much error, and at some point you cannot uh, uh, cope with your random errors, and you have to first correct by changing your measurement basis. So this is the sequential, like, this is the sequential measurements because some of the measurements you can do simultaneously because they are space like separated, they commute, so they don't interact with each other so much. So you can do them together, but at some point you have to stop. And this is important because this uh, tells you how fast you can do your computation. It doesn't match with the circuit all the time. We will see some examples. And here is one of the most prominent example. This is the cluster state. It's uh, one of the examples of the graph states. And this is measurement-based quantum computation on cluster states. If you don't know the topic, this is the go-to paper. Like you should read this paper in detail and then you understand more or less what's going on in the measurement-based quantum computation. And um, uh, so this is a cluster state. You see that it's two-dimensional. All the vertices are plus and uh, all the edges are control Z gates. We will see what they are, but what's important is that they commute. So you can draw things together, you, like all this, uh, it doesn't matter in which uh, way you apply. So you take the tensor number of vertices uh, of this product state and you apply all these entangling gates. So if we considered only these two qubits over here, this would be a ball state that we had in the previous slides, this ball state. So it's just maximally entangled states put in a certain way together. 
Okay, this is the important state. So let's look at its, some of its MVQC properties because then we will compare our new model with it, how it's different and how, what's the similarity with it. So as we saw, the preparation gates is here is control Z gate. Uh, I'm sorry, it's okay if I click it colors, so I won't anymore. So this is the control Z gate and it's important. This is important because if we know that our uh, control Z gate, like C not gate is also in the second Clifford hierarchy as you see here. So we know that only Pauli measurements would not be enough for universal quantum computation. So we have to do some other measurements. First measurement is the Pauli measurement that Pauli measurements will be creating all the other Clifford gates. But then we will have to do something outside of Pauli, which are the eigenstates of second Clifford hierarchy. This will be creating something else, which is called the T gate, which will give the universality to the uh, all this all universal power. And this is uh, to what is my new theorem that only Pauli is not enough. And here, the random gates that we will have to take care of is very similar to what we saw in the teleportation protocol. And this is what makes cluster state MBQC really pleasant, that it's only X and Z. And uh, you can pretty much push them till the end of the, the computation, and you can post select your uh, classical data. And about uh, what, what is this one is that if you want to implement a circuit in which you, ho you have only um, second Clifford hierarchy, you don't have to do any adaptation of measurements. So you can measure everything in parallel. So you need it pretty much one time step to prepare everything. But every time you have to prepare something else, which is the T gate here, then you have to pause your uh, measurements and then you have to wait the previous measurement outcomes in order to correct some randomness. Okay. Good. Okay, so this colorful slide just demonstrates how many different resources are there out there. So there is some honeycomb lattice, Kangome lattice. There is something here. We will look a bit more careful to this, this these hypergraph states. And there is something uh, that we did on hypergraph states uh, ourselves. There is a, a conceptual difference between other previous work. But why I'm showing you this slide is that, as I mentioned, there is a huge, uh, uh, debate or there was a huge debate whether you need a lot of entanglement in the resource to guarantee the universal quantum computation or not. So certain people said you need a lot, certain people said no you don't. So for example their papers uh, universal quantum computation with little entanglement. Most quantum states are too entangled to be useful as a computational resource. So there seems to be some uh, like, like different uh, opinions I myself think that all the publications pretty much that I am based on, they are not contradictory to each other and they are correct because there are a lot of entanglement measures and they do different things. So there is a hint that you might not need a lot of entanglement, but it's not clear whether this entanglement measure is good to say anything about quantum computation or not. I mean, this is not clear, so you can find some entanglement measure which is completely like, very high, but your states are completely useless, maybe, so then, I still think it's all these results are really interesting, but I mean, they are not contradicting each other. But there is still a big question, right, in the community. Like, main question is what makes the state useful for measurement-based quantum computation? And I won't be answering this question because it's too difficult, but I will be like telling you how I started to work on this topic and then how I, it led me to come up with the uh, measurement-based quantum computation scheme using hypergraph state. Like, it hinted me what would be a good state. I'm not saying this is a general thing at all, but I think it's interesting to take a look. So let's look uh, the first. Let's look at the first steps again, and this is teleportation protocol. And uh, we know that we, if we have a perfect Bell state, we can have a perfect teleportation protocol. We can implement the identity gate with fidelity one, with the process fidelity. But let's ask the question: What happens if we don't have the perfect? Uh, if we have a noisy state? Okay, we don't have a perfect uh, Bell state, but we have something of this form. So we have an, some arbitrary alpha in the phase gate, and we also mix the state with the white noise. And then we try to do teleportation. So Alice and Bob know their resource state, and they want to teleport the arbitrary input state, but they have the full right to apply the correction unitaries, the whatever unitaries they want. It doesn't have to be Pau, the X and Z anymore, because we want to characterize the power of the state. So we give Alice and Bob full right to rotate their measurement basis. So we don't restrict measurement basis at all. So now at the moment, the state is important. And now what do we see here? It's a, uh, this is some um, 
graph, we chose plots that shows the following thing. The red one is the maximally entangled state and it's parameterized with the probability of mixing white noise. And this, as you see that entanglement and fidelity is decreasing at the same time. So it comes all the way down to here while it becomes separable. The yellow one is just different phases, okay? When the state becomes not maximally entangled anymore. So yellow, I don't even remember, it's quantitatively important, I think, that what is yellow phase exactly, this doesn't matter, but it's, I mean, yellow is better, more entangled than the blue one, blue is more entangled than green one, but it's just a phase that you, I change. But the parameterization is again the, is again the uh, probability mixture of white noise. But now you can ask, like, is there some state here which might be better than these superior states? How can we do it? Let's do some random search. Let's apply it. I sampled within 10,000 uh, states. It's not so much, but I also had other hints to say that uh, uh, I couldn't prove it. I'll be very happy to discuss this and prove it. I mean, I actually just wanted a hint. I didn't actually go into detail to prove this. So, but I think it uh, might not be very trivial proof. If you come up with it, I'm very happy to listen to it. But that my conjecture is that there is nothing on this side. Okay, so the Bell state mixed with white noise is still the best one. So all the random states, these small dots here, are all the random states, random pure qubit state, two qubits, entangled states. These one are mixed states down here, bunched all of them together, not so good for computation. I mean, I know it's very hand wavy, but it's just a hint, like whether you need a, it's just an introduction or motivational part of the talk. So still it's interesting. Can something be on this side or no? I don't know. To my experience, I haven't found any. I sampled, I mean, this particular plot has 10,000, but I've sampled much more and I took one of the plots. So everything is usually on the other side. And it's gonna be very interesting if somebody finds some nice state on this side it would be quite cool too. It would make the state special. Okay, now this was for two qubits. Now we can continue to do a similar thing for three qubits. And it's again the 1D chain. So again, what happens here is that you have some noise uh, with respect to alpha, and then you are mixing with the white noise on uh, both sides. There is no global white noise though, so it individually I'm mixing them. And then one can compute the optimal process fidelity again. Like what would be Alice's measurement outcome and how Bob and Charlie could rotate their bases back or rotate their measurement bases in order to get the best uh, close fidelity to the, to the identity. And here it's a similar plot. Okay, so there is a localizable entanglement, which means that there is averagely how much entanglement can be localized between Alice and Charlie if Bob makes the measurement. So how much of the bell states you can get from Alice to Charlie. So characteristically, it's very similar thing as the last uh, plot. But here you get the same thing. This is a bell state with, uh, mixed with white noise. And then these are just other uh, graphs, this noisy or different phase gates. And then what I did, because we are going to be talking about the hypergraph state, you can just check that it's somewhere here, hypergraph state. So it's worse than, I mean, you have to mix quite some white noise with the bell state to come down here. But we will see what a hypergraph state is. So just a, uh, think that we might have trouble to create measurement-based quantum computation using such states. They don't seem to be good even to teleport the data from one point in your state to an, another. But let's see. I mean, there is a scheme, so... Questions? Uh, I have just a generic question about this. So, because here you consider a noise on the states and uh, did you think about also the measurement uh, noise? <laughs> like the noise so in the I measurement? Want to, yeah. I want to characterize the states for measurement-based quantum computation. So in that sense, uh, my question was in this direction, right? I want to know which states are useful. So for this, I'm giving full power to the measurement, absolutely full power to the measurements, okay? I don't even say in which Clifford hierarchy they should be, but of course it's possible. But it could also be possible that you can transform somehow noise to the measurements to the states, right? You can just apply this noisy channel back on the state. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So not really. I think there is the, you can do it in one-to-one -one correspondence. This thing, but I I was interested in the states in this particular sure. point. Yeah. More questions? Okay. So then I take it as a. But I was very clear, so I'll continue. If I'm too fast or too slow, please tell me. <laughs> okay, so let me start a short introduction on hypergraph states. 
So what a hypergraph state is, it's a generalization of graph states. We have to very quickly see what a graph state is then. It's a collection of vertices and edges, and then edges are these control Z gates, which are two qubit entangling gates, and the uh, vertices are pluses. And if you apply, you get an entangled state, multipartite, genuine multipartite entangled state. And this is the stabilizer formalism. We don't really need this. It's more to see an analogy between uh, graphs and hypergraph states. So what you can do here, you can look at the first qubit. You can write Pauli x here and Pauli z on its neighbors, which are Pauli z2 and z3. You can do the same for g2, which is now x2. You write x here uh, and uh, z here and z here. And then you, if you take all this, if you take a group, you can create a stabilizer group, which has a graph state as a unique eigenstate with a plus, min, plus one eigenvalue. Okay, this uh, alternative definition, you can use this definition or this one as you wish. But the hypergraph state looks very similar, the actual writing of the definition, but what changes here, you can have here um, bigger edges, you can have their hyper edges. So hyper edge could be something of the form which here it was only one and two, one and three, here you can have something of seven only, single Z gate, or you can have something of four, six, and seven, which is a hyper edge or arbitrary. It's the, uh, set of some power set here if you want to take. So, and for example, let's take the control control Z gate, which is acting on four, six, and seven. This is a three qubit gate. It's two power three by two power three gate. And every, again, everything commutes because it's diagonal. So it's just more like loser entangling thing if you want to think about it. And we will see the consequences very quickly. To see an analogy to a stabilizer formalism, we can do the following thing. If you can uh, write the following operators. Let's write X on the first qubit and let's look at its adjacency. This is what we call because there is not a real neighborhood in the sense of graph neighborhood. So two and three are adjacent to one because they're in the same uh, hyper edge. And then you can take X1 tensor control Z on two and three. I stopped writing Z's uh, because I would have to write a lot of control controls. So it's just C of two, three. And it's the same here. Uh, let's look at the symmetric. So if you take X here and if you tensor it with one, three, you get the following. And again, you can create a group. It's a commuting group. And you know that hypergraph state is the eigenstate to it with a plus one eigenvalue. So there is this analogy. But this is a non-local stabilizer, okay? Something in the previous slide, this was local. Everything was a tensor product of local Pauli operators. This is not the case anymore. So then the first fruitful thing out of this uh, stabilizer formalism is that you can write down, uh, this is uh, the result from Mermin, if you take a GHD state, which corresponds to fully connected graph state, you can write the graph state in the way that, uh, you can write its stabilizer uh, in a certain way that uh, it's gonna be symmetric, and then you can sh see that uh, quantum value of this Bell inequality, if you write Bell inequality by summing and taking difference of all the stabilizers, the quantum value can be two to the power n minus one. But this is because the graph state is eigenstate of the stabilizer with plus one local stabilizer. But the classical value is, uh, as you see, exponentially smaller. So you violate some classical Mermin inequality exponentially. So what we did, we just applied the, we took the similar inequality, it's not exactly the same similar inequality, but again, tensor product of local Pauli's, and we applied the, we took the fully connected n qubit hypergraph state where every three edges connected with each other. Okay, and then we show that there is similar scaling. I mean, classical bound remains to be the same, but the quantum bound starts to scale exponentially again. It's a slightly less, but it says greater or equal because there are several cases here. And the worst case for number of, it's like mod eight cases. The worst case is the following. And uh, now, like, why is this uh, nice or why is it important is that you can uh, actually go to every four connected here, every three qubit is connected. You can do now every four connected and you can continue playing this game. And you see that it's, these kind of states have an advantage that if you uh, trace out even uh, half parties in uh, this case, you still violate certain Bell inequalities. But here in the GHD state, if you lose one of the particles, then it becomes fully classical resource. So this has a bit more, uh, this has quite some robustness uh, uh, against the particle loss, okay? But this is just the artifact of having bigger edges, like you, you lose less if you lose one of the particles from this hyper edge. Okay, this is some non-local, yes? One simple question. Yes. Yes? Uh, you are doing everything for qubits. Yes. Only qubits, okay, mm -hmm. okay. You can do similar things for Q dits, mm -hmm. uh, but what happens there, I mean, uh, 
I like current existing uh, protocols on qubits, but certain things go wrong there. Some of the, you don't have these Clifford gates and nice things there. So you have to either consider the um, subsection of some, um, okay, let me put it this way. So the nice thing about qubit hypergraph states is the Boolean function definition. So you can say that uh, your hypergraph state can be written as something of this form. Uh, sum of uh, minus one to the power of function of x, where your x is the computational basis elements here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's most general function here you can have. So it, graph state would be something of this form, okay? If you have x1, x2, and x3, graph state is always of something of this form, function of, uh, of some type of x1 times x2 plus x2 times x3 of something of this form but a hypergraph state is the most general Boolean function. But when you go in qubits, you have to start doing uh, the f powers of uh, uh, the root of unity. And it gets really complicated if you consider the full function characterization, if you consider every possible function, it gets too messy. And you lose all this graphical description. Okay, so then you have to consider some subset of functions and then it's a bit artificial. So in QDIT, it either gets too messy or, in my opinion, it becomes to be a bit artificial. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 I think but for even generalize. Deep yes. Is, for deep rhyming, I think this formalism works too, but well, it's just. Uh, I can tell you in the presentation what goes wrong when we, I mean, I have to get to the point. To this point, everything works. Okay. 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 So, Thanks. but something, something will go wrong, which is a very nice characterization of that you have in the graph state doesn't work in that uh, QD high graph states or hyper graph states anymore. And I'll point out. Good. I lost that. Okay. Probably somebody switched up the microphone because I don't hear anything anymore. So I'll continue. Thanks for the question. Um, actually, I just arrived to that thing, what I was talking about. And this is something called local complementation. This is the local uh, Clifford, second Clifford hierarchy equivalence between two graph states, if you wish to say. So for example, the following uh, transformation, maybe you know about it, maybe not. So I'm gonna quickly introduce it. It's called local complementation. What you do, you take the stabilizer of that certain qubit. So let's say this red qubit and the stabilizer consists of this Z's here and Pauli x, and you take a square root and apply to the state. Because square root of the Pauli's are Clifford second hierarchy, you just apply the Clifford. It's called local Clifford or local complementation the way you want. But what it does, it uh, looks uh, at the neighborhood of this particular vertex, red vertex, and it complements the neighborhood. So if things were connected, it disconnects. And if things were not connected, it just connects with each other. So what it means that these two graphs are local unitary equivalent to each other, so uh, we don't have to consider them as two different graphs, like they have the same exact properties. And you can play around and like apply the same exact rule here. But now if you write down the uh, higher dimensional Pauli's and if you apply exactly the same operation, you, you go outside of the graph or hypergraph state formalism. Okay, in QDT you don't have this nice transformation anymore. And usually this transformation is important because it connects graphs with the error correcting codes and uh, there is uh, fruitful applications, but then you queued it, you stop to have this in the full generality. So in that sense, uh, I'm not so uh, happy about that uh, happening. So it's either becomes too difficult or too narrow in my opinion. So I'm not working <laughs> so much on that, but there are some people who are brave enough to uh, tackle with this problem, luckily. Uh, so what happens here, this is, let's look at the equivalences here uh, in the hypergraph state. So this is three qubit hypergraph state. It's SLOCC equivalent to a GHD state, if you know what that means. If not, don't worry. Uh, so what happens here, if you apply Pauli X gate, you get uh, something in the neighborhood, in a adjacency. It gets connected and you can just play around. So now all these, uh, all three qubit hypergraph states are equivalent and they're locally integrated to each other. And the motivation for doing uh, this hypergraph states is that in the beginning, people thought, oh, it has more uh, coherent terms. So probably it's gonna be equivalent to GHD state because there is this SLOCC classes of GHD and W state, but it's not, it's equivalent to uh, GHD state, uh, not to W. So unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, but that's how it is. So, but this um, uh, non-local property that it had, that if you lost the particle, it still remained entangled. This is a bit, looks like the W state. 
kind of. So it's somehow in between in the non-locality properties. But now this drawing is for four qubit hyperbar states. This first one is not entangled, it's just for symmetries. And the, these are all the hyperbar states which are not local unitary or SLOCC. They are not equivalent to each other under any local transformation. So I'm just showing because it explodes, okay? If you go in five qubits, you have more and more, you have much more hyperbar states than graph states, of course. But uh, luckily you can do some nice tricks uh, on it. You can also define some com local complementation things that you can play a lot of games uh, if you are interested into drawing such things and finding which hypergraphs are equivalent to each other. I'm not sure if the rule itself is very important here. It's just the uh, formalism that you can create here. So what you can do is, for example, you can apply square root of stabilizer to the hypergraph too. And if you do so, what it does is that similar to the graph states, what we had here, that it was connecting the neighborhood, the following map, here it also connects the neighborhood in the adjacencies in the following way. But now you might complain that this is not a local transformation, so you change the entanglement properties, and of course you are right. But what you can do, for example, here, you can apply two of these maps with each other on different qubits. And their non-local transformation here shows up with the here because you have a plus sign. Here it shows up with minus sign, square root of minus sign. Here you have minus sign, it shows up with a plus sign and they cancel and becomes, so here it acts with an identity, this local com complementation rule. But on the other hand, this guy in the neighborhood has this single qubit and has this two qubits, so it creates such an edge. So in the sense that you can start noticing that even if something, if something is not entirely in the hyper edge, you can start to create hyper edges in, uh, around it. So unfortunately, this topology of these graphs and hypergraph states don't tell really much about the, so you cannot use really much graph theory or hypergraph theory because it's things change, connectivities change. Um, okay, so this is a, just a, we call it a sandwich rule. You can also create, you can start with three uniform hypergraph states, which we call something with only three edges. And you apply this in a smart way, the square root of x's, and you can create this kind of four edge. So even if you can, if you start with only um, third, third Clifford hierarchy, you apply something to it, uh, like a second Clifford hierarchy, you can even get outside, which is not surprising, but it's nice to have a graphical rule, like what actually happens to the state, because we will use all this for measurement-based quantum computation. Questions? Okay, now it's gonna get simpler because we are gonna go to graph states again and then we will look at uh, measurement based quantum computation finally. So uh, in graphs, what we have is that we can, we saw that if we have a graph state and we apply Pauli measurements, we again stay in um, what Smanil Nil theorem tells that we cannot have the full quantum computation. But we, we still wanna learn the uh, measurements because these are very important measurements and for graph states, these have been well established and we know that any Pauli measurement on a graph state leaves us in the graph state space. We still get a graph state. For, so for example, what happens here, if you measure qubit five in Pauli Z basis, you can just like cut all the edges. You can remove the, uh, everything connected to it. So you, you get the following disconnected graph and this is just Pauli Z up to Pauli Z correction. If you do the same on hypergraph state, unfortunately what happens, and this is very important for our MDQC protocol, you either get a Bell state so what happens is that you imagine that you have three nails and you have some rubber around it, you remove one of the rubbers. So you get either this thing or you get with probability one half, you get the fully separable state. So now if you wanna have the hypergraph state uh, purely making out of, uh, making with the three, made out of three edges, and as soon as you make Pauli Z measurements, you are done you, with one half probability, you might get completely useless pro uh, protocol which is, uh, seems a bit uh, hopeless at the moment. So then what happens in the Pauli X measurement, if we take the Pauli X measurement basis in the graph, what it does, it takes the Pauli, one outcome of Pauli Z and it superposes with another outcome of Pauli Z, right? And it appears that you can apply some local unitaries here such that it will again look like a graph state. It's equivalent to a graph state. It's a bit complicated rule. It's not important. We are not gonna look at it. If you're interested, I'll tell you what it is, of course. But what happens in the hypergraph states, when you take this equal superposition and you mix them, you superpose these together, you cannot apply any local unitary such that you can come back to the hypergraph state. 
So if you apply Pauli X measurement to a hypergraph state, it's hopeless. You get outside of the. So Pauli Z gave you only probabilistic results. Pauli X is quite a bad one because it brings you outside. So it looks a bit hopeless at the moment. So let's look at what are the consequences and I'll quickly go to one note. There could be two possibilities that somebody can do, okay? One can have such a hypergraph and then one can apply Pauli Z measurements on these red qubits, okay? And what can happen is that as we saw in the neighborhood, it could connect the neighborhood. But there is a one half chance probability that it will connect. There is a one half chance probability that it will just live in the product state. Okay, so if you wanna map to a cluster state, start, starting from such a complicated hypergraph, you have a really little, little probability of getting your desired state. But of course, if you could map to a cluster state, then you can apply entire measurement based protocol to a cluster state. But this would be very wasteful, first of all, to create such a state and then with a very little probability to map to cluster states. So this is not very good. But this is the first uh, idea that could come to your mind. There are some other schemes by Akimaza Miyake, which, uh, so it's, he draws like this in his paper. This, he means that these are hyper edges of this form, okay? So there is a hypergraph uh, like flower somehow around this uh, red uh, vertex. And what he does is that he makes Pauli X measurements uh, here, Pauli Z measurements, sorry, here, and he ends up with certain uh, connectivity, but he uses some um, percolation and statistical uh, uh, methods to say that he will uh, like converge to what he wants to converge in the end. But because it's probabilistic and then there is this probabilistic schemes and uh, he wants to, like he argues that he will be able to get similar connectivity on this lattice copied many times. But he can, this, uh, papers, these papers cannot argue about uh, like depth of the computation and so on because everything is probabilistic. So now we will try to make everything deterministic even though we have all these difficulties, okay? So we will have deterministic measurement based quantum computation on hypergraph states using only Pauli measurements. So no complicated measurements. It seems for now comp uh, very, not possible, but uh, like these results that I showed that having a bell state or graph state is very important for um, in the beginning, this is what led to uh, thinking, how can we get an MDQC protocol using hypergraph states? So first of all, what we did, we derived how the X measurement rule, it's complicated, I don't expect you to read it, but uh, let's look at the pictures again, because this is the beauty of this language, you can use just the pictures. So. Now what I'm gonna be doing, instead of drawing this thing, I'll be drawing this thing. And you will know now why, because I don't wanna draw this all the time. So what I mean is that here, every three edges, con everything is connected, every combination is connected to this vertex, okay? But here, it's just three copies of it. I have these three vertices down, one, two, three, and everything is pairwise connected to every vertex up there. So I'll be drawing just like this. And now, if I made X my basis measurement here, what the previous page proves here that it will be effectively treated as if this was a graph state. Post-measurement states, everything will be as if it's a graph state. So this is, for example, the case. If you take the following state, which is exactly this one, and if you make Pauli X basis measurement here, you not only it brings you outside of the hypergraph state formalist, but you even get the deterministic 1D cluster state. Okay, and now let's look what happens here. So what this is, this is just additional hyper edge here, drawn over here. Now if I make again, if I draw this hyper edge here and if I make Pauli X measurement, I get this again, the Bell state, uh, this 1D cluster state, but additionally I could have this uh, with the probability one quarter or two fifths, I don't remember now, it's not important. You get this uh, uh, additional uh, edge, but that's not a problem because we know this local complementation, we can just apply here local complementation. And this is local unitary equivalent to this one because these two are, if they are connected, you can just apply local complementation on qubit five and they will get disconnected. So all these two things are kind of local unitary equivalent. Okay, so we already have some good thing that starting from a hypergraph state, deterministically we can map to a graph state. But we don't want to do just this. We want to only use the Pauli measurements. If we just map to a rough state, we would need to use non-Pauli measurements only also. So, so we come up with this ugly looking uh, resource state, okay? 
but uh, it's ugly looking, I agree, but uh, it's a proof of principle, right? That only hyper state can do, these states can do such measurements. So our universal gate set will be control control Z gate and the Hadamard gate. And this is just a scheme how you would do it. So just uh, very shortly to tell you how you would do this is that you would start from uh, all these yellow boxes, okay, which are not, uh, Probably. all these yellow boxes which are not at attached to this uh, control control z gate we would measure all the others like the ones which are like these guys we would just measure in x phases and this would effectively give us such a hybrid like hybrid graph hypergraph but now this part over here let's take let's say this part and i just redraw it here now what happens with this uh, this yellow in this case we can go ahead and if we want, we can measure this in Pauli X basis. This one. If you measure this, sorry, Pauli Z basis. If you measure this in Pauli Z basis, it just goes away. Because what Pauli Z did, it just removed the vertices, right? It removed from, I told you if you had this rubber around. So, but here what you see, you have only single, there is no connection between these guys. So if you remove all these lower parts, this, all these pins start to connect only single, like four, five, and six, they get completely decoupled from each other if you measure in Pauli Z basis. But additionally, if you had the following hypergraph around, this would just remain there. This would get untouched. So effectively, while measuring Pauli Z, you can just remove a box. If you measure in Pauli X, you can map to a graph, st a graph state. So now what happens that if you wanna use this part as the control control Z gate in your teleportation protocol in your like, measurement based quantum computation protocol, if you want to use apply control control Z to input state, you could just measure X and Z on it in the following way. And this would just implement for you control control Z on any input that would come in from here. And as you see, this has three inputs. So there would be something coming in from here, from here and from here. So whatever state will be teleported up there, it will just apply control control Z to it. But this is nearest neighbor interaction. So what you can do, actually, we want to somehow implement the swap to be able to twist the wires the way we want in the computation. But what you can do, you can go ahead and map to the following graph state, the parts which you don't want to apply control, control Z gate to, and you can like just put everything together. You can keep calculate making, like getting rid of arbitrary extra qubits, and you can come down to the, this uh, hexagonal lattice that we had in the beginning. But hexagonal lattice is universal for, uh, quantum computation, but only if you apply Pauli and X and Z basis, you can do swap for free. I mean, this is a Clifford gate. So swap is a Clifford gate, so it can be doing one step. So all the swaps can be parallelized. So what it means that all the control control Z gates, nearest neighbor, plus swaps can be done in one step. Okay, so you don't need any adaptivity, but we have a problem. Unfortunately, we have a problem that we have control Z X and Z random gates. So we have non-local random gates. What can we do? We have to correct it. I mean, we have worked so much to get this, so we kind of don't give up in this point. So we go ahead and do the following thing. We can apply control control Z gates in, uh, so let's say somebody gives us a scheme with a, con a lot of control control Z gates and the Hadamard gates meshed up all together and ask us, how can you implement, in which depth can you implement this using using MBQC. So what can you do is that you can put all the Hadamard layer together. And before that, you can implement all the control control Z gates in one step, whatever you, you have to do. But before you change your measurement phases, you have to correct, you have to do the correction step. You have to get rid of additional, this control, ugly control Zs that we had. You have to get rid of it because if, you, if it meets with Hadamard gates, then it becomes really ugly. So you have to, uh, annihilate somehow in this step all these control Z gates and so on. You have to go continue the computation, but what's important here is that you only have to do adaptation of measurement basis or otherwise you have to wait for your previous measurement outcomes whenever you have to change your measurement basis, your uh, computational basis, okay? Let's start here. Let's see here we start with uh, how the X computational basis, we can play around, we can act this control control Z gates but before we go to computational basis, we have to make an adaptation. We can to make a correction step. So to say it otherwise, the computational depth grows as, uh, as uh, often as you have to change the basis of your computation. 
So it exactly matches with the circuit computation because all the control Z gates commute, all the Hadamard's gates commute, but these two doesn't commute. So whenever you will have a circuit, I can implement exactly the same depths in my MBQC protocol. Uh, sorry, now, um, yes. ask, like, I think I didn't get it how to do this correction. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is coming now. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, so I said, I mean, we want to do this, so now we will see how to do it. How <laughs> nice. to do it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so what happens is that we implemented control control Z gates. And uh, so, so let's see it in the, the following way. So we have certain computation, certain, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm not very good at, in, that's why I draw the things in, in in advance, I'm not very good at like uh, improvising and drawing, but let's say this is the uh, our lattice where we have a bunch of qubits, and we are here. We implemented control control Z gates, but we know that they came with the errors. But because errors uh, control Z errors, uh, they also are uh, uh, Clifford errors. They can like change each other the way they want, and they can come up to this point. Like you can collect them, you can post process them uh, to the point where here you have to do Hadamard. Let's say you know that next thing coming is disastrous Hadamard. But what you can do before implementing Hadamard, you can actually map your high, uh, hyperwrap state to this honeycomb lattice here, okay? And then you implement Hadamard, but this honeycomb lattice itself that we saw that we can map to, I mean, it was just mapping from hyperwrap state to the honeycomb lattice down here, it's universal. It's universal. So you can, with Pauli measurements, it can correct any Clifford error. So it goes ahead, this guy, I don't know how, I don't care how, because I don't have exact uh, protocol, but if you give me exact protocol, what you want to do, I'll tell you which measurements to make. But it will correct, okay? So this step corrects your uh, control Z errors, and up to here, up to this point now, you arrive, this is this blue, this is this blue part. It's drawn uh, thin because you kind of, like want it to be thin, but we don't know how big it is, of course. I mean, it could be arbitrarily, you, you could have uh, uh, n choose two to the power like n square up to, you might have to correct up to n square control the errors because the error might be between any qubit, right? So it can be really ugly to connect this, correct this, but it's in principle, it's possible to correct. So up to this point, up to the Hadamard gate, there will be control control Z gates X and Z errors. But this we want to implement, and X and Z, X and Z, they can just go through the Hadamard, they, they just become Z and X, right? They just change each other, so that's not a problem. Okay, but this, uh, this is a crucial step that you can actually create in the middle of the computation. You can actually plan. You can actually plan in advance when you have a, such a chip. You can assume that you will have the worst error, and you can plan this blue zone, how big you able to uh, correct n square errors. You can say that this part in my uh, resource is planned for correcting errors. This, uh, this is planned for whatever computation. It will, I mean, it will be able to compute. So it depends on how many qubits and what kind of uh, uh, circuit you want to implement. Does this answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> you helped me for the transition, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, this is just, again, the same picture. So now what can we do is that uh, we can uh, summarize and compare to what we have like with the cluster state in comparison. So what you can see is that uh, this control Z gate was in the second Clifford hierarchy, but now control control Z gate is in the third Clifford hierarchy. So here Pauli measurements were not enough, but here indeed they are enough because of the Gottesman new theorem, you can just go around it and you can implement control control Z gate in Hadamard gate. Here you have to implement, you have to chop up uh, into a Pauli measurement and you have to rotate your measurement basis. Uh, so random gates here were smaller, but here they are this, uh, you can have entire Clifford circuit pretty much as a random, uh, random gates. Uh, you are missing Hadamard to do the transformation, but Hadamard comes in in the computation. But then parallelization here, you could parallelize everything which was in a uh, second Clifford hierarchy. Here, on the other hand, you can parallelize everything until you have to change your computational basis from X to Z. So this is just uh, 
uh, properties of them. Now, if you have something which uh, some uh, experimental setup where you naturally have bigger interactions rather than two qubit interactions, you would you might prefer to make hypergraph states. I mean, these results, I believe, because we have measurement tools, uh, which we just didn't uh, write down any MVPC protocol for them, it can also go into the bigger hyper edges. So it depends what kind of uh, architecture you have. If, uh, but there is this trade off, depends what's difficult for you. But usually this is easier to create, of course, but this is just proof of principle comparison that you can still do Pauli measurements on hyperrustics. So questions about this? No? Yeah, so okay, maybe just yes. uh, in general, I mean, you might have partially answered this, but it's uh, sure. like, uh, I, maybe I couldn't remember everything, but like, uh, so here we have like the comparison of what types of gates you need to use, right? Uh, and what type of resources in a sense. And uh, my question would be, what about like the uh, number of them in a sense that, you know, let's say fixed number of qubits and uh, like worst case scenario or something. Uh, that's a good question. To be honest, I don't remember exactly. I can open the paper quickly because we have a, I mean, this paper was already two years ago, this particular result. So I don't exactly sure, remember, sure. but we, we characterized like, I can quickly open actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like in principle, it's uh, you have still like 10 minutes or something including. Okay. That. Uh, so, so it's up, uh, up to you. Yeah, I don't know how much. So if you care about, let me tell you what happens. If you care about exact numbers, we can open the paper or you can open late, later, but I can tell you in principle what happens. So, um, there are certain things, certain, let's say, uh, control uh, N power Z gate, some really control, big control Z gate. If you wanna prepare on the cluster state, you can say that I wanna prepare it in the depth one. It's possible to create in the depth one, but you, need, you would need exponential number of resources, exponential number of qubits, exponential number of uh, uh, connections. So here you would be able to create in the logarithmic depths, but you will need polynomial number of qubits and polynomial number of edges. So there is a trade-off, see? Like time, how much time you want to spend to prepare and how much resources you want to make and the other way around. So that's right. why these two schemes uh, are good because uh, you can, it gives you an idea because now you have this, uh, all this information, now you want to prepare something fast there, but it shows up that here you can also prepare exactly the same thing because it's an, universal, both of them are universal. But there is this time thing, depends which architecture you wanna use. Sure, thanks. So there is a trade-off. Right. But I mean, it's a funny trade-off because it's a constant time depth and exponential qubits and logarithmic time depth and then polynomial qubits. Depends yeah, what yeah. you have, right? <laughs> so <laughs> depends what you wanna do. So exact numbers, I don't remember. It's like five times n squared plus something. <laughs> sure, sure, no, I mean exact yeah. numbers. So, yeah. Yeah, so qualitatively it emphasizes this uh, trade-off, this results. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me go to the summary then. So I tried to somehow motivate or convince you that having a bell state is good enough for MBQC. Of course you knew this, uh, but um, I mean, I think that if you have it, then very, it's very easy to come up with MBQC protocol up to some uh, weeks of work, of course. I mean, you cannot right away write down the MDQC protocol because you have to correct all the unitaries. But uh, I think, I mean, these graphs uh, of, uh, or my conjecture that everything would be on the left side of this noisy graph, uh, it shows something because these are numerical results and some of the things could be proven there. But uh, I think it's important and it's an important question because a lot of people try to characterize a lot of MDQC protocols and it's, there is no unified theory, right? So then what we worked on hypergraph states. We saw a bit uh, of their Pauli measurements and local unitary equivalences. And finally, uh, we worked on this uh, MVQC protocol. We saw this uh, using hypergraph states. I mean, for me, at least when I started to work on MVQC protocol on hypergraph states, it looked a bit hopeless. So I was happy to come up with this, all the measurement schemes. It looks a bit technical and the state looks ugly. I agree with that. If, you have, don't think so, I still think that it looks ugly a bit, but it's proof of principle. So the outlook, uh, which uh, I hope some of, uh, also my master's student in, is here, so she's gonna work on some of this stuff, that um, in general, uh, which hypergraph states are useful? Because the question is too complicated to ask which states are useful. 
in general. So for the hypergraph stated piece, uh, now we are working on something which characterizes entanglement properties in these states, such that at least to say that you cannot use hypergraph state if it looks, if it's entanglement properties like this. This is also a very difficult problem because there are a lot of hypergraph states, but it's a bit, you can identify certain classes there. And then, um, of course, it's interesting to study this entanglement contained in these uh, different measures. Uh, and uh, finally, this uh, non-locality and self-testing of hypergraph states. People, we have certain symmetric results, but nobody has worked on it in full generality. There is no scheme. If I give you a hypergraph state, how would you self-test or how would you uh, find its bell inequality? This is not known, that it violates or even a weakness. So these things are all uh, unresolved. Uh, and of course, this uh, big question, whether entanglement and the resource of MBQC have anything in necessary or sufficient or condition or something that looks like a, uh, as a condition for being useful for resources for MBQC if state is entangled in a certain way. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marie. So, uh, Zoom uh, clapping. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, are there any questions from the audience? I okay. So, so so far, I don't see anyone. I mean, of course, everyone can unmute him or herself and say something. Uh, so uh, I can just continue with my uh, first question, maybe. Because, uh, so sure. I don't know much about those, uh, this measurement-based co quantum computation, but maybe v like it, uh, a very generic, uh, generally. So what do you think about like my, what are the actual prospects for you know for NISC devices with this regard? Because uh, well, I mean, I, I only saw that uh, this is, of course, nice in the long run, but uh, in those needs devices, uh, of course, like, uh, so not only gates are super bad, but uh, also like those measurements. That's uh, like kind of, I, I was asking before about measurement noise, and this is often very terrible. And uh, like to, so there are some methods to mitigate this measurement noise quite well, but when you have like estimation of statistics and uh, here you know every outcome is important for this uh, this computation okay. right and uh, so this sorry this is just like uh, on the, i'll save you opinion, trouble maybe. yeah <laughs> i'll save you trouble of being apologetic and tell you that i think this is a theory research i mean mm -hmm. you are here assuming the end almost going to limit of infinity number of qubits okay and you are assuming that they are not into they are interacting with each other they are close to each other uh, such that you can do computation, but they are not really messing up each other much. So, for example, uh, we have these results that some hypergraph states, if you lose the particle, you will be more robust, but depends on the architecture. Now, if you have them in ion trap and if something goes out of the ion trap, the, infra the architecture changes completely. Mm -hmm. if you, so, all these things are, as I see, I hope I'm not upsetting anybody, these MDQC things are uh, very... Uh, fundamental but also theory research but of course now if one goes into repeater business and things like this some of the concepts from here might be useful like because we developed this theory entire theories so at some point in some application in these quantum networks or things like this it could turn out to be useful right but, of uh, course. yeah sure sure <laughs> I don't see them anybody implementing NBQC protocol of hypergraph states uh, for 1024 qubits anyhow in my lifetime maybe i don't know i'll be happy if they do but <laughs> yeah oh, sure know. sure thank you uh, so i, I see marcus uh, appeared uh, hi, on marcus. the screen <laughs> so maybe first a comment related to your question uh, philip one essential part for the measurement based computation is that you do measurements kind of uh, and you need the post measurement state in many yeah. current architectures, it's a, a bit of a problem to do a measurement and then continue doing computation. That's true, that's true. Yeah. So, so that's a bit of a, a trouble kind of in the near term devices. They are clearly also when you want to do error correction, at the same time, you have to do some measurements and then go on with your calculation. So huh. it's the same problem, but it has not been addressed much. The question I have, uh, not so much related to the talk, but uh, 
do you have already an idea what entanglement measure could be related to the power oh, kind, wow. of in, kind of computation for the states? So I have seen papers, the idea of the measures that I have that they are useless. So I have more ideas of what is useless, okay? The most used uh, pure state measures. I still have a hope for localizable entanglement at how much entanglement you can localize between the start of the measurement till the end, but there are some results which show that this might not be necessary, hinting in this direction. So it's, it's a difficult question. <laughs> so, I mean, if you have a localizable entanglement which is equal to one, if you can connect Bell state from point A to B, then of course you can do computation there. But this might not be necessary, you know? It's sufficient, but might not be necessary. Oh. So, I mean, this is what I try to show with this noise, right? Uh, that if you have much entanglement localized, then it's good. But if it's that, <laughs> we don't know. So there are some results also with David, with whom I work now, who has a certain paper saying that uh, much entanglement is not necessary. And they, what they do is that they take the very noisy state of this form, something of this form, and they still implement uh, you need to implement always uh, according to, like in one step of teleportation, you always have to implement a Hadamard gate and some noise. So they do implement a Hadamard gate and some noise. If you now make a measurement here on a noisy state, you will implement something of this form, but your noise is so bad that you will need entire quantum computation to correct it. So then, I mean, it's not only point to make the noise, I mean, to, to random gates, right? You have to be able to interpret your measurement outcomes. So this is, uh, I think this is not very correct thing to say that you can have a very little entanglement and do whatever you want. <laughs> this I kind of don't believe. I mean, I have no proof of that, right? But I don't believe that that's the case. But if you have some idea, I mean, I'm very happy to discuss. <laughs> well, uh, as I might have told you at least a couple of times, I'm opposing kind of to have a single measure to characterize yeah. entanglement since it always gives you a total ordering. If you just have a single measure, you map into the real numbers which are totally ordered and mm -hmm. multi-partite entanglement is not kind of a, a total order. Sure. So I, I yeah. it, it, it's still it can at the same time, if you just want to characterize some kind of computational power, you end up with a single number in the end. Yeah. If you're able to characterize that by a single number, and so there could be an entanglement measure, but uh, it's hard to come up with the. Right I absolutely part. agree. I mean, there are also, I mean, all these measures, some of them are good, some of them are bad. They are like not really comparable with each other. So I absolutely agree. So I don't, when I say entanglement properties, I don't mean one measure or two measures. Some, like it's more qualitative thing, like what uh, this uh, matrix product state do, for example. Some, there has to be certain. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> new form, formalism or something like that, which will study these problems, probably. But I don't know exactly. I agree it cannot be one measure. I don't expect this to be have like this, which will say what's uh, necessary and sufficient for MDQC. This <laughs> cannot be. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, and then more questions, I see Rafael. Uh, uh, just one curiosity. Uh, about one of these questions you had in the end, you have at least uh, uh, some hypergraph states or a class of hypergraph states which can be useful for some MDQC scan. Do you, mm -hmm. do you have some idea? Do, you have a, do I have an idea which others will be useful? Yes. So, I mean, you can somehow generalize our methods to a bigger hyper edges. Uh, to like not three qubits to others because we have an idea there, but uh, it would resemble this one. I mean, it would be, we wouldn't learn much out of this. Other than that, to be honest, we don't, we don't have anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just didn't, we didn't see something uh, that we, that would teach us a lot of new things about the whole classification. There are some small adjustments you can do in the protocol, but this would resemble stay similar, you know, to what we have now. So, but we don't have general classification, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. But I don't know whether that would be, I mean, 
it would be nice to have to study to maybe it will give us some hint about the general states but uh, I don't know I don't even know like which what you would ask there because as Marcus pointed out measurements uh, like this uh, uh, entanglement measures gives you just one number right it doesn't really tell you much about the state so mm -hmm. ah, in the like it's even question. tricky to ask a question yeah yes and uh, I know that there are experimental schemes for graph states, but hypergraph states, do you do know if there are experimental implementations? So it's uh, not as a state. Of course, some people implement truffle gates, which is uh, up to Hadamard gate, the same thing. But uh, I don't know any research, uh, anybody has, who has done the hypergraph state, even three qubit one, and let's say try to measure something and violate the inequality. No, this is not done yet. Mm -hmm. It's also difficult to do so. Yes, I think to so. Keep it as a state rather than a gate, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. So, some people have promised to do it, but then they give up. <laughs> so, it's not very easy, mm -hmm. apparently. I don't know much about the uh, scheme. I just know that it decomposes in some six C not gates and uh, five Hadamards and some other phase gates, and this just gives them really slow, little fidelity. I, I just found some mm -hmm. Nature article from last year, which oh. apparently implemented some graph states for neural networks. I, I don't know the quality of this paper, but... No, gra graph states, yes, but it's hypergraph states. Hyper, sorry, hypergraph states. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, of when course. Is it, uh, when is it from? I just sent it to the chat, but uh, you oh, can great. take a look at this. I think uh, it's... Uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't have it in the title, so... Uh, I was just, you know, quickly googling keywords and uh, <laughs> I do have it. After, if it's uh, after September, that's when I graduated. Uh, no, PhD. it's called <laughs> Artificial Neuron Implemented on an Actual Quantum Processor, it's called. <laughs> uh, mm. Oh, this one, yes. And they, see that, they say that they implement so hypergraph states at some point okay. there. If you okay. control F hypergraph, then it appears a lot of times. <laughs> mm. Good. Yeah, so well, at I, least, I, at I, least I just found it, so I have no idea. <laughs> have what, yeah. Okay, I have to take a look. If it's uh, later, I, as I mentioned, I didn't follow up research. So, I mean, I do work, uh, close some work on these uh, uh, problems because now I work on something else completely unrelated. So it's difficult to follow up everything, but thanks a lot. I mean, I would be interested to take a look. Okay, nice. Uh, Right, so are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I have just a quick like a question actually to Marcus <laughs> regarding what, uh, what you said earlier, uh, like about this post, post uh, measurement states. So do you know if like those architectures that, that are like currently existing, are there any like physical uh, problems with this regard or is it like an engineering problem? Because I know it's not uh, like people didn't do it. I think in uh, experiments, there's uh, the like post measurement uh, 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 states and based computation. But uh, is it impossible for some architectures from physical uh, reasons? Do you know this or uh, or not? I, I I'm really not up to date, but I recall well, actually now almost ten years ago discussing with Rainer Blatt about the iron trap and. They say when they perform measurements on one iron, it's just heating up the phonon mode of the other ions, and then after that they have trouble doing gates on the other ones. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Clearly, kind of here, if you have only local measurements, kind of without the, I understood in the hypergraph situation, you need non-local gates in between. To do kind of correction operations, but uh, if you are sticking to the graph states, then it's really just everything local, and you would not need those qubits anymore. But the problem is whether the measurement itself has an effect on the other yet to be measured qubits. Kind of uh, uh. whether the measurement itself uh, is really a local measurement or whether it has a global effect. So it's That's also the same. Sorry, it's also the same for hypergraph states. You need to correct the non-local errors, but you can correct it locally, actually. Okay. 
yeah so it's but you are right sorry to <laughs> i thought you were finished because i had that uh, sense kind of the did you remark about the very post measurement state uh, is not relevant for the qubit you're measuring but it's a question whether you're really implementing identity tensor the projection on the, the particular mm -hmm. state or whether you have some kind of uh, uh, yeah, so I am like absolutely sure it's not the case in the like current technology. <laughs> they say I I have no clue. Say for the solid state based qubits, uh, how there the measurement process is really physically implemented. But uh, it is that in the in terms of the iron traps. There is this problem that the the phonon mode, which you are using to implement gates, kind of is affected by the measurement. Okay. Okay. At least to uh, some extent. I see. So that's that's uh, nice. Yeah, Thank it's you. really kind of a, when I talked to Rainer Black was quite some time ago. So mm -hmm. they have also make progress uh, in implementing the measurements in between. But uh, I even recall kind of. Uh, it was one of my first conferences back in 96, where Asher Perez had the paradigm delay every measurement to the very end of your calculations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As a computer scientist, I would say perform a measurement whenever you can measure something. Then you only have to process classical information. But uh, because of the different time scales and the effects kind of, of really extracting information, it's not a clear answer kind of what to prefer. At least that's my take so far. Sure, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, Mari, for pu pushing the discussion. <laughs> so, uh, oh, well, I mean, my, my pleasure. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, great. So uh, I don't know. So still, uh, does anyone want to add something or shall we finish? <laughs> uh, Okay, cool. So uh, thanks a lot uh, once again, Marie. That was a great yeah, sure. talk. Uh, so thanks, thanks guys, everyone. For nice, yeah. <laughs> thanks everyone for coming, and uh, so see you. Uh, most of you hopefully next week. <laughs>